And yet I'm still surprised by the magnitude of divergence and the kind of the speed with which this this um, correlation broke down. Um, but I do think it's it's one of those ongoing signs of just fiscal dominance where interest rates are no longer the decelerator uh, that they that they are in a in an environment where there's less public debt. So when there's when there's more public debt, interest rates have a much more mixed outcome of of slowing down the economy than they do when you have low low public debt and, and higher private debt or, or more money creation from the private side. Lynn Aylin, a famous macro analyst and financial strategist, has very positive predictions for Bitcoin, which is the world's biggest cryptocurrency by market capitalization. Aylin thinks that safe haven assets like gold and Bitcoin will do better and see even bigger price rises before the cycle ends. The well-known macro analyst Aylin recently told BlockWorks Macro that he thought Bitcoin would hit $100,000 in the next 18 months. Another person who was there was Luke Roman, a famous macro analyst and Bitcoin fan. Alden said that the basics of Bitcoin are set up to support higher prices. When Bitcoin hing happens again, it lowers there will be even less Bitcoin available for demand as mining costs rise and miners hold on to their block awards until the price goes up. This will put even more pressure on the available Bitcoin. Supply this cycle because almost a dozen spot Bitcoin. Exchange-traded funds in the U.S. were approved and went live without a hitch. The place during her chat with BlockWorks, she talked about how Bitcoin ETFs have made it easier for thousands of institutional investors to invest in Bitcoin and have helped drive up the price of the underlying cryptocurrency. Alden also talked about her thoughts on the way things are going in the U.S. economy right now, comparing it to the highly expensive years between 1940 and 1970. Alden thinks that we are about to enter another decade of high inflation, during which prices will stay high and be harder to control. Here are some clips from the talk. Please watch them all the way through. Enjoy the video and don't forget to like and share it. This is Lynn Alden's masterclass on fiscal dominance, liquidity conditions, inflation, and the central bank's inability to solve the problem. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Add to that point by, um, you know, pointing out that if you chart gold price next to uh, U.S. fiscal deficits as a percentage of GDP, um, that actually matches somewhat closely over the timeline of this chart. So you would have had really big deficits during the global financial crisis. Then they obviously cooled down a bit between that and and COVID. Then they blew out in COVID, um, and then um, you know we had this lull in you know. 2022 or so, where the deficits cooled down, and now they're reaccelerating again, and we see gold breaking out again. Um, and so, kind of my my left curve, like you know, kind of low IQ take is that it, it's not you know the the that the fiscal deficits are driving it to a significant degree. In addition to all the all the things that that Luke mentioned around just changing geopolitical views on you know what you want is your reserve asset for kind of tail risk reasons. Um, and you know, if 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 you would have asked me a few years ago. Um, would have I expected a divergence of this big? I would say probably not. And that that's from someone who's long gold and not long long duration treasuries. Um, and yet I'm still surprised by the magnitude of divergence and the kind of the speed with which this this um, correlation broke down. Um, but I do think it's it's one of those ongoing signs of just fiscal dominance where interest rates are no longer the decelerator. Uh, that they that they are in a in an environment where there's less public debt. So when there's when there's more public debt, interest rates have a much more mixed outcome of of slowing down the economy than they do when you have low low public debt and and higher private debt or or more money creation from the private side. Short answer is it's when fiscal matters a lot more than pol monetary policy, and it shapes what what they can do with monetary policy. Basically, monetary policy becomes, uh, they're less independent, less able to control what they want to do because the fiscal side is is such an ongoing issue for them. And the way I kind of characterize that is the difference between the 70s and the 40s. Um, so those are both inflationary decades. When people think of inflation, they always think of the 70s, but the 40s were on average equally inflationary. And in the 70s, most of the money creation was from bank lending. Right, so that was not in any way fiscal dominance. Even though we were running significant fiscal deficits, that was the smaller component. A lot of it was bank lending. So you had a very high money multiplier. You had um, kind of record sustained issuance of bank loans, um, large because you had baby boomers entering the home buying years, uh, for example, the kind of peak credit formation years. Um, and so you had the surge in bank loans, surge in, in corporate bond issuance. A lot of this was private sector driven. Um, and when they wanted to slow that down, 
because there's all this new money being created from from fractional reserve lending by raising interest rates. Um, they could they could obviously harm borrowers. They could slow that process down pretty significantly. And even though uh, that did increase federal interest expense, because federal debt to GDP was low, like thirty percent, it doesn't increase interest expense from the public side as fast as it slows down the private sector. When you go back to the 40s, it was a very different environment because most of the money creation in that era was not from bank lending. It was not from corporate bond issuance. It was from it was from large fiscal deficits. Um, and so you had large monetized fiscal deficits. The central bank and the commercial banking system had to buy most of the bonds. Um, so you got that money multiplier effect, but it was very fiscal driven. And the problem is when you have 100% debt to GDP – uh, if you were to raise interest rates, um, the interest expense that you generate uh, on the on the public side would be bigger than the amount of of reduction you have on the private sector side. Uh, and so that's why that's why public debts matter because eventually, if if debts get high enough, you go through the looking glass where higher rates no longer have that kind of firm decelerator aspect that they do in, in, in kind of lower public debt environments. And instead, it's, it's either more mixed, or in some cases, if it's, if it's really imbalanced, it can be an outright accelerator, where the additions to fiscal deficits, which are stimulatory, because all that interest expense, all that spending is someone else's income, uh, that can overweight uh, or, or, or overshadow what's happening in the private sector side. And I think, I think we're kind of experiencing that to a certain degree where we're not at the point where it completely overshadows it, but they're roughly um, you know, on similar magnitudes now. And so you have a much uh, more muted effect from monetary policy than you would have in the 70s compared to fiscal policy. Since central banks started printing money in large amounts and on a large scale during the pandemic three years ago, inflation has been a repeating theme. Financial experts warned that bad things would happen. They warned again when they started to raise rates in 2022, even though central banks like the U.S. Federal Reserve think the fight against inflation is almost over. Alden says that it's only the beginning. According to the famous macroeconomist, we are in for a decade of rising prices, and central banks don't have the tools they need to deal with it. Here are some more clips from the interview. Obfuscation is a kind of a key method there. Um, and so when we go back to, say, 2019, for example, when the repo rate spike happened, you know, you kind of describe it in financial jargon. You say, look, there's a repo problem. And for people that were kind of paying attention, including Luke, about looking at, you know, like the, it, the supply over issuance of T-bills versus, uh, you know, reserves and, and other kind of sources of liquidity, um, a lot of people were pointing out that they're going to have to start buying T-bills. Um, and then they had to start buying T-bills. And it's like, well, why are you buying T-bills when you said you were going to be tightening, right? And, and you said you're going to be shrinking the balance sheet. Um, and they never say, look, we, ha we have to kind of monetize fiscal deficits a little bit here. That's not how you phrase it. You, <laughs> you phrase it as, as put it, put it, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing it's with- not it's, yeah, it's not QE. It's not QE. It's not QE. It's just, you know, and, 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 and so that's, I, I think we'll probably see things like that. I mean, for example, you know, F fiscal dominance would be less inflationary if it imploded the private sector. So, for example, by raising rates so quickly, they blew out interest expense, but they also killed some of the banks. Um, but when those banks started to fail, instead of letting deposits that are uninsured go bust, um, they, they bail out the deposits. And so they kind of soften what happens on the private sector uh, while putting the gas on the on the public side. And that's where you get you know, fiscal dominance being more inflationary. So it could include things like SLR rules changes, kind of, you know, financial jargon that helps banks hold more treasuries, which is also basically what they did in the 1940s. Uh, it wasn't just the Fed monetizing all the treasuries. It was other pools of capital, including banks. And banks, you know, because they have fractional reserve, you know, policies, that they can hold quite a bit of treasuries depending on regulations around them. Uh, especially if those if those treasuries are shorter term, um, and so there, there's all manner of, of things they can do. Even things like stable coins are now a new source of treasuries that they can kind of just push out there. You know, uh, from the top level, countries are often trying to de-dollarize now around the margins, whereas the the people are often not trying to de-dollarize. You don't see, you know, if you go to the the, the currency markets in Cairo, it's dollars. It's not yuan. It's not you know, yen, it's not everything else, it's, it's dollars. Um, and so in a lot of these different countries, you know, stable coins have over 99% of the, the market share, uh, like do is dollars, not other currencies. Um, and so that's, that's basically a new source of demand for, for T-bills. So I think there's a bunch of little levers they can pull 
to kind of put treasuries in a lot of different places. Um, and I think that's probably going to be the name of the game for, for quite a while. As Alden says, there are two key reasons why the broad money supply grows faster than usual, which usually means that consumer prices go up. The first reason is fast bank lending, which can be affected by a lot of people needing credit at the same time. The inflationary situation in the 1970s was caused by baby boomers buying homes, which led to a lot of fast bank lending. Large monetized fiscal deficits are the second reason why broad money supply is larger than usual. These tend to be linked to conflicts like the First World War in the 1910s, the Second World War in the 1940s, and the COVID-19 pandemic in the early 2020s. These unusually large budget deficits and new money creation are not linked to bank credit creation, so they can't be lowered by controlling bank lending, which is what the Fed is doing now by raising interest rates. This is why Alden thinks the Fed is trying to fight the current 1940s-style inflation with tools that work better for a different type of inflation, like the one we had in the 1970s. As a result, the problem won't be solved permanently until the fundamentals are fixed. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to our channel and turn on post alerts. You can also check out our other videos with insightful macro and market analysis from Alden and other expert analysts. Thanks for watching.